Uh, I failed to recognize my uh, collaborators yesterday when I gave a talk, so I'm going to make sure I do it this time. Um, Natalia Obashenko was a programmer analyst that worked on this uh, project with me, and uh, Tom Nudds is my thesis co-advisor. This is some work on uh, Lake Erie walleye from the second chapter of my thesis. And uh, um, Lake Erie walleye, of course, walleye is a sister species to your uh, European pike perch, equally tasty and equally valuable. So the talk is about uh, Lake Erie walleye. Lake Erie shown here in the Laurentian Great Lakes Basin. It's the shallowest, uh, most southerly and warmest, most productive of the five Great Lakes. The uh, annual landings in the commercial gillnet fishery on the Canadian side of the lake are worth about $30 million a year. There is no commercial fishery on the southern side of the lake in U.S. waters where the, where the walleye are reserved for sportsmen and the large charter boat fleet that they have there. Lake Erie walleye are managed on the basis of uh, several management units which extend across the uh, international line shown here in blue. From uh, west to east, Lake Erie is uh, shallow to deep. It's uh, eutrophic in the west end, uh, oligotrophic in the east end. There are two sort of groups of walleye stocks. There's a western stock, oops. There's a western stock that occupies this international TAC area, management units one, two, and three. And there's some eastern stocks which are not part of this international TAC area. My talk is going to focus on the western stocks. Uh, the majority of the harvest, 90% of all the harvest, comes from these stocks and, uh, and the uh, tax setting process there. In the commercial fishery on the Canadian side of the lake, we have this problem called the initial allocation problem. The quota year runs from January to December. At the end of December, any quota that hasn't been used up by individual fishermen is lost. Unfortunately, the tax setting process takes the first three months of the year, and the tax aren't actually set until the end of, end of March. And, uh, but then spawning starts. Spawning usually takes place in this population <laughs> through the month of April. And the final ITQs aren't released to the fishery until May 1st. This leaves the commercial fishery with a problem. They need to have an initial allocation for that period, January 1st, to the end of spawning, and the release of the final ITQs on May 1st. In recent times, well, prior, prior to 2008, they were very uh, uh, precautionary in terms of how much initial allocation was allowed, less than 5% of the final lake-wide tag. In recent years, they've increased it slightly to in the range of 10 to 13% of the final tag that's allowed to be caught. Now, this has some social economic implications for the fishery because you can see that that period uh, covers Lent. Uh, Lent is a period where there's a huge market for fresh fish in our part of the world. The profitability of fishing for and, and bringing fresh fish to market during that time period is, is, is quite high. And uh, given climate change and so on, we expect to have a more ice-free uh, fishing season from January to May as, uh, as time goes on. So that's the initial allocation problem. The objective of the chapter was to try and get a better understanding of the relationship between initial allocation policies and and risk to the uh, walleye population. And more specifically to address this question, you know, what proportion of that annual tack can safely be harvested in that first uh, five months of the year, and including the walleye spawning season. So we took a Bayesian approach to incorporating uncertainty in this problem, uh, particularly in the estimation of stock recruitment uh, model parameters. I'm not, uh, not going to bother with this uh, very basic explanation of the Bayesian approach at this point in the proceedings. These are some of the data that we had to work with. These are uh, statistical catch at age model outputs from the Lake Erie Walleye Task Group, interagency task group that, uh, that does this work. The age twos are considered the recruiting year class to the fishery, although they're certainly not fully selected by the gear. And they're shown here in the white bars. And you can see that uh, age two, uh, or year classes, recruited at age two into the fishery in a big way in 1984, 1986, and again in 2003. But it's highly variable, as you would expect from a periodic life history strategist like walleye. Here I've, uh, here I've lagged the recruits uh, two years, back two years, to show you the relationship between uh, spawning stock abundance in the blue and the recruits that were produced two years later by those spawners. And you can see that sometimes we have uh, very low abundance of spawners producing very large year classes and very high abundance of spawners producing quite poor year classes. 
exactly what we might expect from a, a Ricker stock recruitment function. And there is lots of evidence in other papers that have shown that probably the Ricker stock recruitment model is the most appropriate for this fishery. Again, we, uh, you know, we're, we're here, we're going to estimate parameters, alpha, beta, and uh, sigma for the stock recruitment function. We regard the recruits as two-year-olds <coughs> two years later, and we got, regard the spawning stock as everything three years and older. <coughs> Uh, we uh, calculate the likelihood function as shown here, and we use uh, uh, uniform broad priors for alpha, beta, and, uh, and sigma in the analysis. And uh, here's some of the results, the joint posterior distribution for the, for the three uh, model parameters in the uh, Ricker function, sigma, alpha, and beta. And uh, you can see that that's uh, uh, fairly fairly good uh, relationship there. And here's the marginal posterior distributions, significantly updated from the uh, uniform priors that were used in the analysis for alpha, beta, and sigma. Uh, just a very quick demonstration that the convergence was not a problem in the analysis. Uh, this is just an example for alpha. And I probably didn't need this, but just for those of you that need to the, understand uh, the stochastic forecasting approach, we we sample from the distributions of alpha, beta, and, and uh, sigma, and uh, use those uh, samples in the uh, trials for the various simulations. The simulation runs out 50 years, and uh, you know, we repeat it 1,000 times so that we can assess the statistical properties of the output. This is an example of some of the simulated recruitment dynamics. The observed uh, recruitment dynamics for Lake Erie walleye are in the blue, and our predicted dynamics are uh, in the... Uh, the red, if you want to call it that, and you can say that you can see that we've got uh, a fairly realistic simulation of the recruitment dynamics going here. We then use those uh, recruitment uh, that, that recruitment model in an age structured simulation model. Uh, nothing fancy here. It's uh, you know just the ab abundance and uh, um, natural mortality assumed to be 0.32 for this population and the uh, fishing mortality for each age class scaled by the selectivity for that age class. And the, uh, we calculate the catch using the Baranoff catch equation. Again, nothing particularly fancy here. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, catch specific to any particular year class given, uh, again, the fishing mortality, the selectivity, and the natural mortality. So the ecological risk analysis, a couple questions arise when you set out to do this kind of a thing. Uh, how are we going to measure the risk of overfishing or collapse of the stock here? Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to keep it simple and look at the risk as a, measured as the percent of years when the population abundance falls below some specified thresholds, which raises the question, what are those thresholds? What should they be? And, uh, and what would be the acceptable level of risks of falling below those thresholds. Well, we, uh, we determined that in terms of overall uh, spawning stock abundance, this is uh, age two and older fish, so the recruits and the spawning stock together. 16 million fish was the uh, minimum uh, estimate on, on, uh, in the time series. So we use that as our threshold in this case. And so what we've got here is the probability of the abundance falling below 60 million fish over the 20 year, oh, sorry, over the 50 year simulation. The uh, horizontal axis shows the uh, constant fishing mortality rates that were used in the simulation. And the uh, different colored bars indicate the initial allocation that was allowed, the amount of, the, the percentage of the total allowable catch over the year that was allowed to be taken before May 1st, ranging from five to uh, 50%. And if you look at the vertical axis, that's your risk measure, you know, the probability. And you can see that the levels are relatively low. I mean, uh, the highest it goes is uh, 6% in this particular case. And there's not a great deal of uh, variation across the different allocation, initial allocation policies, just a couple percentage points at risk. Interesting that at low fishing mortality rates, below 0.2, it makes absolutely no difference whether the initial allocation is 5 or 50%. But if we look at the uh, abundance of the spawning stock itself, and here the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, number in the time series was 10.8 million fish, three years and older. Uh, the first thing you'll note is that the, uh, the axis, the vertical axis in terms of the risk is an order of magnitude higher than the one that I, that I showed you a, a moment ago. 
Uh, this ranges up to 7, and this goes all the way up to 45 percent. So there's a much higher risk uh, in any case, regardless of the initial allocation policy of the spawning stock falling below that threshold. But again, you can see that it's not particularly sensitive to the initial allocation policy, whether it's 5 percent or 50 percent. Uh, this is an interesting finding, given that uh, the economic and social implications of uh, initial allocation policies. And uh, lastly, this is uh, 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 isopleths showing the uh, uh, relationship between fishing mortality, uh, individual allocation, and the average catch. These, uh, these values are uh, in thousands of fish, so this, this would represent 5 million fish as the average catch. And these this lines down here, 3 million, uh, 3.2 million, and so on. And you can see fairly clearly that up to initial allocations of around 0 0.2, 0 0.25, there's virtually no effect of initial allocation on the average catch. But we start to see these deviations as soon as we get into slightly higher fishing mortality rates. So, you know, low to moderate fishing mortality rates, which are typically what we have in this fishery, um, seem to be relatively insensitive to initial allocations. So in terms of some conclusions, we feel that this result is uh, consistent with some, the idea that there might be more capacity in, this, in this, these walleye stocks, these western stocks, to, to sustain higher initial allocations than the 10 to 13 percent that is currently allocated. That uh, the managers of the fishery and the, and the various stakeholders, including the uh, sport fishing stakeholders, might go confidently go forward with a, a, an active adaptive management approach to to initial allocations, you know, trying to reduce some of the key uncertainties here through, uh, through active adaptive management. However, there's a few caveats. Um, this is a pretty simplistic analysis, I recognize that. It ignores numerous sources of uncertainty about how the fishery and the population might respond to initial allocation policies. I've assumed uh, RICR, uh, stock recruitment dynamics. I think that's a fairly safe assumption, but it might be interesting to kind of repeat the early analysis that was done here on uh, Central Baltic herring and the value of information that might be derived from knowing what the true stock recruitment dynamics would be. It ignores the uh, implications of phenotypic change or fishing-induced evolution and how those might change the stock recruitment dynamics. Same thing with maternal effects, age truncation of the population due to, uh, due to fishing it uh, during spawning. And these last two are two that the management agencies have mentioned to, to uh, us in particular, and that is the sustainability of harvesting on spawning aggregations of weak stock units. And I mentioned that these are western stocks, it's a mixed stock, and uh, they have concerns of uh, uh, springtime aggregations, you know, localized spawning aggregations being uh, heavily exploited when uh, initial allocations are allowed to be high. And finally, just the effects of gill nets on, uh, on uh, spawning behavior, you know, on the spawning grounds. How am I doing for time? Uh, Great. And uh, so uh, just to finish up, I wanted to maybe draw some management implications from this, particularly with respect to items <laughs> four and uh, five here. So uh, Western Lake Erie uh, right here includes in quota zone one in the Canadian waters a very large zone that is uh, where gill nets are prohibited, uh, essentially during the uh, walleye spawning season, uh, the whole month and then two weeks on either side of that month. So uh, commercial fishermen are not allowed to set gill nets in that area. Now it turns out because of historical reasons that 80% of the walleye tack in Canadian waters is held by uh, quota zone one license holders. That's an, uh, that's an historical artifact from back in the time when the quotas were first brought in, back in the 80s. And so what we have is the majority of the TAC, and therefore the majority of the initial allocation, being held by license holders in this zone, where the spawning is occurring. So what, uh, what I'm suggesting to the management agencies based on this analysis, if they're concerned about affecting individual stocks, and, and, and having uh, effects on walleye spawning behavior and so on, that they should start to allow uh, quota transfers across quota zones, which they don't currently allow. With the idea, the idea being that uh, during this spring initial allocation period, uh, co license holders would be allowed to transfer their quota from quota zone one out into quota zone two or quota zone three, away from the spawning aggregations 
that are in that part of the lake at that time of year. And uh, uh, this is uh, you know, one of the more uh, practical implications of, uh, of the work that we've done here. So some acknowledgments primarily to the uh, Canadian Fisheries Research Network that uh, Rob, Robert Stevenson mentioned earlier this, this morning and to uh, my uh, fellow students in the lab at the University of Guelph. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you.